When I think about the legacy of human space exploration, it's just amazing to actually be a part of it, to know that it runs right up to and through me. It's uh, pretty humbling. And we spend a lot of time thinking about some of the tragedies that we've had to deal with. Risk is a consequence of progress. We're in a very, very similar phase in our program as we were back in Apollo 1 by storytelling, hearing from the people who lived those experiences, Apollo, Columbia, Challenger, that can be more in the forefront of our mind and we can be really understanding that our decisions have consequences. Apollo really changed a generation because it inspired a lot of people. Apollo taught us that it's not impossible to set audacious goals. Standing where we are, looking out on the horizon and having Orion and SLS in development, having SpaceX and Boeing vehicles in development is an interesting time. It, it's, it reminds you of all of those stories that you've heard about the care that it took to create Apollo and all the vehicles leading up to that. Everybody knew the risk, but uh, I think we, as young guys, most of us considered ourselves, uh, you know, we were able to leap tall buildings at a bound and we were bulletproof and, and we were going to get it right. The appreciation of the risk and the hazards is always there, but that was the first time we had had a, a problem that had cost us a life other than a plane crash. I think on Apollo 1, it was just a matter of the fact that we had gotten away with so much on, a, on Mercury and, sh and uh, on, on Gemini that we just went ahead and did business as usual, and it, it bit us finally. We were having all kinds of technical problems with the spacecraft. This machine was really a poor one. Poor from the standpoint of design, poor from the standpoint of checkout, poor from the standpoint of control of the safety of the systems, the wiring, communications were bad, but we were willing to go ahead. That was a mistake, very, very serious mistake. Gus was very upset all the time about not being able to talk to the blockhouse. He used to say that, how the hell are you going to do this if you, how are you going to do space flight if you can't even talk to me on the, from the pad to the blockers? But how are you going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings? Now, we've been going all day. I didn't, I wasn't at my console all day. I went back to my office, it was going so slow. There was a sudden jolt in our headsets of something that happened. We heard the we heard an explosion. We heard people's voices screaming, both inside and outside the spacecraft. And then there was dead silence. First thing I could came through my mind was, my God, it'll take us a long time to get over this. I knew that we were in deep, serious trouble, but 
I did, didn't know that the astronauts had been killed, but I had an inkling that that was the case. It was a pretty horrible feeling, knowing that they were dead and knowing what had happened, knowing that we really had, a, we all had a, been a party to putting the pilots in that position. To this day, it's my personal opinion that I haven't actually pinned down precisely where the spark came that ignited things at 100% oxygen, because we also didn't have uh, all fireproof material in there then like we did later. The whole crew was gone in uh, less than 20 seconds. Uh, it was clear that a lot of the materials in hindsight that we had inside the spacecraft shouldn't have been in there. I mean, you know, I mean, they're too, too likely to burn. Everything is is combustible in, in, in a high-pressure oxygen environment. In this case, the pressure was only a few PSI above ambient, but it was pure. I've seen people with uh, technicians walk into a high-oxygen environment where they forgot they were smoking and smoke a cigarette, and you, you walk in and poosh, it just, that cigarette would go up and, you know, burn their Burn their face. Quite frankly, I, I heard a tape of it. it was 13 seconds. That's all it took. I never got the screaming out of my mind. Another hard thing to see, I remember walking into a, a building down there and it was refrigerated. I remember it being very cold, but the three suits were laid out over here with a, a harps over them. That was sort of a gruesome sight. I th think I always had good confidence that that we would overcome that terrible problem on, on Apollo 1 and uh, be able to, to bounce back and uh, luckily we, we did. The top management in NASA, Bob Gilrude, George Lowe, uh, the people in Washington realized when that fire happened we were in a situation where we had to be, we had to change everything. Everything had to be changed to make sure that that we were doing our best. So he brought the top people in the, of those organizations together and said, what do we got to do to fix this machine? That's what we did. That was a hell of a job. It took a change in people, a change in thinking, it took a, ch a change in culture to make that happen. And I don't think we would have ever had the opportunity to do that if the fire hadn't happened. If we'd have just kept going and the fire hadn't happened, I think we would have been making mistake after mistake after mistake, and we, I think we would have killed a lot more people, actually in flight, had, had we not done that. That really, uh, really brought it home to us that, you know, we gotta do our job right, and we can't tolerate any uh, waiving of requirements or cutting the corners. We knew that that mission, that the first mission, was very important. If this mission fails, it's not going to fail because of me. We were not there for the fun of it. We were not there just for the notoriety of it. We were there to help an objective along that, as we look back on it today, is probably the greatest accomplishment in the 20th century.